Welcome Trinity family to Trinity Kimberly Way. It is our pleasure to lead you in worship this weekend. And we want to extend a special welcome to those of you who might be worshiping with us for the first time. My name is Pastor Nick Price. I'm one of the pastors here at Trinity. And I want to encourage you to fill out our Connect card this morning to let us know that you're worshiping with us. And if there are ways that we can be praying for you or helping you take your next step in your walk with God, you can let us know. You'll notice in the chat bar that a little button has popped up inviting you to connect with us. And if you just click on that, you can tell us a little bit about yourself. And again, if there's ways that we could pray for you or help you take your next step or get connected to the rest of the Trinity community, we would love for you to let us know. But for all of us who are gathered here this weekend, I want to remind us that we are in the Easter season. It's this time when this Jesus' disciples knew that he was indeed risen from the dead, but at the same time they had a lot of doubts and a lot of concerns because they didn't know what the future held. And yet one of the things that Jesus said to them over and over and over again is that he came to bring them peace. That's the title of the series that we're in right now. And so as Easter people, we want to begin our worship by actually going before God in prayer. Because it reminds us of who he is, that he's present with us, and it reminds us of the peace that he came to bring. And so I want to invite you to join me as we begin our worship in prayer, focusing on the presence of our God with us by speaking together the words of Psalm 100. We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We are Easter people, celebrating Christ's victory over sin and death by saying, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is our God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Well, we want to continue in a time of praise. We invite you to stand as we sing together our opening hymn.
many times when we gather together in worship, we come before God in an attitude of confession. And there are really two reasons that we do that. First reason is that it simply acknowledges that none of us is perfect. That actually in church, it's okay to not be okay. And that our sins and our shortcomings, those things that we've done wrong, that those don't need to get in the way of our relationship with God. We can come as we are. The second reason that we take some time in confession is because it's actually an opportunity to hear God's words of grace spoken in response. And so this morning, I want to invite you to join me as we come before God in an attitude of confession and hear his words of mercy and forgiveness spoken back to us. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. Well, since we are gathered together in God's presence, we take some time now to lay at his feet all of those sins, shortcomings, and failures that burden our hearts, trusting in his mercy and asking for his forgiveness. We pray together. Almighty God, Have mercy upon us. Forgive us our sins and lead us in everlasting life. Amen. Well, hear the good news. Our guilt does not define who we are. In his mercy, God has given his only son to die for us. And through his death on the cross, Jesus paid the price for our guilt and removed our shame. And by his resurrection, He has granted us a new identity as beloved and forgiven children of God. And so this morning, may the peace that passes all understanding guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. You know, it's important that we speak that peace over one another. And so I want to invite you today to turn to those who are worshiping with you and to simply say this, may the peace of Christ be with you. And if you're worshiping uh, solo, if you're by yourself, take this moment now to make the sign of the cross upon your forehead and upon your heart, simply saying, may the peace of Christ be with me. Take a moment now to pass the peace to one another. Well, having passed that peace, I want to invite you now to stand. As together we respond to those words of grace by singing our hymn of response, Jesus, thy blood and righteousness. Jesus, thy blood and righteousness, thy beauty, oh, my glorious trust, bids flaming worlds in these arrayed, with joy shall I be my head.
The first reading from God's word today is Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Our second reading from God's word is found in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 6. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in scripture it says, see, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. And our final scripture reading today is from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 4 through 9. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus. That in every way you were enriched in him, in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you, so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In 1994, I was a vicar. Now, a vicar is kind of an intern pastor. I was serving at St. Andrews in Park Ridge, Illinois, and uh, this was the last thing that I needed to do before I could be ordained and officially become a pastor. So I was kind of learning on the job for a year. And one of my responsibilities was once a month, I would go to a local Catholic nursing home, and uh, there I would do a Lutheran service. See, there were about 20 people that lived there in the nursing home. And uh, even though they would normally during the week go to Catholic Mass, once a month, they really liked to have a Lutheran pastor, and they didn't know I wasn't a pastor yet. Uh, they'd like to have a Lutheran pastor come and do a service for them. And so I would do that, and it was, it was great fun. Uh, they were wonderful people. I really enjoyed the chance to see them every month. There were two nuns uh, that would help me with the service. One of them would play piano, and the other one would go get the residents and, and, and give them their bulletins that I would bring and things like that. It was just a, a great chance uh, to be together up until one month when I forgot. I, I just forgot. It was a Thursday afternoon and I was supposed to go do the service and I was off doing other things and I totally forgot that it was my week to be there at the nursing home. I, from what I'm told, the, the residents were all there patiently waiting. One of the nuns was playing the piano quietly, kind of watching the door, and the other one kept kind of coming up and saying, I'm sure he'll be here in a minute, and then going to look for my car in the parking lot. They finally called the church office, and the secretary said, I don't know where he is. I blew it. I felt terrible. I just felt awful when I found out what I had done. And of course, I apologized uh, to the nuns right away. I went over and apologized. And the next month, I apologized profusely uh, to the residents. But, but I felt terrible. And honestly, I still feel a little terrible even telling you the story right now. This week, as we continue this series that we've been calling Peace, uh, talking about how we can have mental and emotional health, how we can have mental and emotional wholeness through God. Um, we talked about anxiety last week, and this week we want to turn our attention to something new, and that's guilt and shame. I still feel some guilt about not doing that service that day all those years ago, and I feel kind of ashamed that I didn't. What is it about that in our lives? How, how can we deal with guilt and shame in our lives. That's what we're going to talk about. Now, now, first of all, I want you to know that guilt, now not shame, we'll get to that in a minute, but guilt is actually, the Bible teaches us, a gift from God. 
Now, I, I would describe guilt this way. Guilt is when I've done something, and, and what I say is, I did a bad thing, that's guilt. I forgot to go to the nursing home, and I left a lot of people hanging. I did a bad thing, and I felt guilt about it. Now, where does that guilt come from? Well, actually, it comes from inside us. It comes from something God put us when, in us when we were born. In Romans 2, we read these words. Um, Paul's talking about Gentiles. He says, even the Gentiles, even the people that aren't God's people, he says, even the Gentiles who do not have God's written law show that they know his law when they instinctively obey it, even without having heard it. And then he goes on to say this. He says, they demonstrate that God's law is written in their hearts for their own conscience and thoughts either accuse them or tell them they are doing right. In other words, the Bible teaches us that God has given us a gift. He's given us this thing that we call a conscience. He's given us all the ability to instinctively, because God's law is written in our hearts, know what is right and what is wrong. So when I got the phone call uh, at home later on that afternoon from the church secretary saying, hey, where were you? You were supposed to go to the nursing home today. Instantly, I knew I did a bad thing. I knew that was wrong. My conscience told me and I felt some guilt. Now, God's word teaches us that as believers, as followers of him, we even have a, a, a further tool to help us know what's right and wrong in our lives, and that's the gift of the Holy Spirit. When we were baptized, God gave us that gift of his spirit, and when Jesus was describing to his disciples what the Holy Spirit would do in our lives, one of the things he told them, he said, when the Holy Spirit comes, he will convict the world of sin, and in other words, help us understand what sin is, what, what, what things are wrong in our lives, and of God's righteousness. Now, why does God do that? Why does God give us this thing called guilt? Why does he give us a conscience? Why does he want us to feel bad when we do something wrong? Is, is, is that like our punishment or something? No. Remember I said guilt is a gift from God. Literally, guilt is there to help us to repent. We feel bad when we do a bad thing so that we will recognize that what we've done is wrong. It's out of step with God's plan for our lives. It's not good for us. It's not good for the world around us. Literally, the word repent means to turn around. Guilt is God's way of turning us around when we're doing something that we shouldn't do. I want you to kind of picture it this way. Imagine you're riding a bike out in the desert and, uh, and you have no idea you're about to come on this huge canyon and, and you're just riding off in one direction and it's gonna be bad. Guilt is the big stop sign from God. It's the big warning. It's, it's the stop, turn around, don't keep going that direction. If you keep heading in that direction, it's gonna be a disaster. Guilt is God's way of turning us around. But, but here's the thing, once we turn around, once we recognize that what we've done is wrong, once we get the idea that, that we're not living God's best life, we're not living God's best plan for our lives, once guilt does its job, it needs to be done. And, and that's part of God's promise in his word to us as well. In 1 Corinthians 1.8, it says this, God promises that, that he will sustain us to the end, he will be with us every step of our lives, and he will present us guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. See, it's not God's will that I still feel guilt about what happened over 25 years ago. That's never part of God's plan for guilt in our lives. Guilt is to be that temporary thing that helps us realize that what we've done is wrong and turn around and turn to God and then trust in his love and his forgiveness and, and to let it go. We don't have to live guilty lives. In fact, God's plan for us is that we can live guiltless lives. So, so guilt is a gift from God. It's a gift from God to help us when we've done something bad, when we've done something wrong, when we've done something that is out of step with God's plan and what is best for us in our lives. But shame is very, very different. Shame is not a gift from God. In fact, it is the opposite. Shame is a tool of Satan, of the devil in our lives. And, and shame doesn't say, I did a bad thing. What shame does is shame internalizes that bad thing. And shame says, I'm a bad 
person. Here's, here's another way of thinking of this. Shame is guilt held on to too long. It's guilt that we let become personal in our lives. Now, believe it or not, even someone like the Apostle Paul experienced shame. We see it in Romans chapter 7. In, in Romans 7, um, Paul's conscience is accusing him a little bit, and he says things like this. I love the New Living Translation of this. He says, I want to do what's right, but I can't. I want to do what's good, but I don't. I, want to do, I don't want to do what's wrong, but I do it anyway. And we can all relate, right? Paul's feeling some guilt. He's knowing he's done some bad things, or he's left some things undone he should have done, and that's bad too. But then Paul takes it one step further and honestly takes it one step too far. Look what he says. The very next verse, Paul says, oh, what a miserable person I am. Notice, Paul's gone from guilt, I do some bad things sometimes, to shame, and because of that, I'm a bad person. Now, now fortunately, we're going to see Paul doesn't stay there. He understands that, that that's Satan working in his lives, and that's his sinful conscience, uh, his, his, his sinful side getting in the way of God's will for his life. And, and we'll get to that in a minute. But right now, I, I want you to just think about this concept that if, if even someone like Paul could experience shame in his life, we all can. We could all make that mistake of, of, of holding on to guilt too long or taking this gift from God that's supposed to help us repent and, and turn away and letting it start to define who we think we are. When we make that shift from, I did a bad thing to, and because of that, I'm a bad person, that's not God working in our lives. That's Satan working in our lives. And, and actually, it can be even worse than that. Because you see, sometimes the shame in our lives isn't from guilt that we've held on to too long. Sometimes shame in our lives isn't from anything we've done at all, but it's what others have done to us. We get caught up in their sin. I have a good friend who was abused sexually when he was a child. And uh, he spent his whole adult life dealing with the shame he feels because of that. Now, he knows intellectually that he didn't do anything to cause that, that, uh, that that was not his fault. But because of what was done to him as a child, he's, he internalized uh, that those feelings of inadequacy or brokenness or I, I must have done something wrong for this to be happening to me. And, and shame just became a powerful influence in his lives. Folks, Shame is a tool of the devil that can be destructive. It, it can be damaging to our mental and emotional health. It can destroy the shalom, the peace that God wants for us. But there's good news. You see, God has given us the antidote to shame, the only antidote for shame in our lives. The only antidote for shame in our lives is God's truth. One of my favorite movies is the movie in the Nativity Story. In fact, it's become a Schultz family tradition to watch it on Christmas Eve every year. And uh, one of the things I love about it is the interplay in the movie between Joseph and Mary. And uh, it, you know the Christmas story. Jesus is going to be born, and Mary finds out that she's pregnant with Jesus, that she's going to give birth to the Son of God, but Joseph isn't the father. It's a, it's a miracle. And, and at first, Joseph believes that Mary's been unfaithful, but then an angel appears to him in a dream and lets him know, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife. What's conceived in her is, is from God. And, and he understands God's truth, and he makes the commitment that he's going to stand by Mary's side during this. But even though the two of them know God's truth, the village there in Nazareth where they live does not. And they assume the worst about Mary and Joseph. And, uh, and there's this one beautiful scene. They, they're on their way to Bethlehem for the census. And so they have to leave Nazareth behind. And so uh, Joseph and Mary are, are heading out of Nazareth on the main road. And every person they pass is just giving them this stare, this glare. You know, Joseph's former friends who now uh, don't, they think he's worthless because they believe he's done something horribly wrong. And, and Mary's former friends think the same thing about her. And uh, th this woman that Mary used to help teach the children in the village, she gives them this, this glare. 
it's a, it's a walk of shame as they leave the village. But when they get to the very end, they're just about to actually you know, leave Nazareth. I love it. Joseph looks up at Mary and with a smile on his face, he goes, I think they're going to miss us. And Mary laughs. Why don't they feel shame? Everybody in their village thinks they're, they're these horrible sinners that have done these bad things. And because they've done these bad things, they think they're bad people. But they don't feel that shame because they trust God's truth in their lives. And I want you to hear some, God's, some of God's truth for your life uh, as we worship together today. Listen to God's truth for you from his word. First of all, Hebrews 8, 12 says this. God says, I will forgive their wickedness and I will never again remember their sins. Think about that. You know, I told you before, I, I certainly remember my sin, my mistake, when I left all those people waiting for me at the nursing home that day. I remember it, but literally God's word says he doesn't remember it. I don't have to feel ashamed of that because God sees me and God knows that that's not who I am in Christ Jesus. Or how about this? This is 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Hear this. Anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person, Paul says. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. So I can, I can internalize my guilt. I can say I'm a bad person. And God comes along and he says that person is gone. You're not that person. You're a new person. You're a new creation. You have new life through what Jesus has done for you. Or how about this? 1 Peter 2, 6. God says, behold, I'm laying a stone in Zion. He's talking about Jesus. It's a metaphor for Jesus as the stone, the cornerstone on which we can build our lives. He says he's a cornerstone that is chosen and precious. And because he is chosen and precious, because Jesus is that foundation in our lives, it says, whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. There is never a reason for you or I to feel shame in our lives because our lives are built on the rock, the foundation that is Jesus. Or how about this? Remember Paul in Romans 7 saying, you know, I do this bad stuff that I don't want to do. And, and then he, he, he falls into shame. He says, what a wretched person I am. What a horrible person I am. But then right after that, in the next verse, he says, thanks be to God that I have Christ Jesus. And then he starts the next chapter with these words. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Those villagers in Nazareth, they wanted Mary and Joseph to feel condemned. They wanted them to feel ashamed. But they knew God's truth. There is no condemnation. They knew God's truth in their lives, that God loved them and was using them for a special purpose. How about this? This is 1 John 3, 1. One, one more verse for you to think about today. God says this. Uh, John writes, see how much, how very much our Father loves us for he calls us his children, and that is what we are. When God calls you something, that's what you become. And God looks at you, and he says, I don't, I don't care what you've done, what bad things you've done. I, I, I don't care if, you've, if you feel like you're a bad person because of that. You're not, because you are my child because of what Jesus has done for you. God has given us Many, many promises like this in his word. And anytime you're feeling shame, the first place we go to is to his word. And we let his promises assure us that we are new creations, that, that our sins have been taken away, that we have been given new life, that we are God's children. That's who we are. We need feel no shame at all. And you know what? There's even more. God not only gives us the gift of his written word, but he gives us his word to receive through the Lord's Supper. You know, I got to tell you, a couple of weeks ago when we had the chance to celebrate the Lord's Supper together, even though we're apart, it was a special time. And I heard from a lot of you what a special moment that was. I, I heard that even though you would, of course, much rather we could have been together to celebrate that, that because it was different, because it was in these unusual circumstances, in many ways, you thought about it more and it, and it meant even more. When we receive that bread and wine and with it the body and blood of Jesus, it transforms us, it changes us, it gives us forgiveness and life and salvation. It takes away our shame. 
And there's even more. In, uh, in Hebrews 12, it says this. It says, we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. In other words, we are surrounded by people who can speak to us what God has spoken to us in his word. We all need brothers and sisters in Christ in our lives so that when we're feeling guilt, when we're feeling shame, when we refuse to let go of guilt in our past, they can look at us and say, that's not who you are. You're forgiven. You're loved. And by the way, sometimes, sometimes we need those people in our lives to, to be professional. We need them uh, to be able to, to be really good at knowing how to get at that guilt and shame in our lives. And, and we need to see a counselor. I've had the privilege of doing that uh, on a number of different occasions. Um, now, for me, my issue is more anxiety than shame, but, but seeing a counselor who can identify what that problem is that you're dealing with, whether that's anxiety or shame, is nothing to be ashamed about. And, and those counselors are, 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 are people that have been trained to help us cling to God's promises, to point us to the hope that we have in Christ. And, and by the way, if you want to find uh, some resources to help you, in that process of dealing with shame in your life, again, I'd tell you to go to our website, tlcforyou.org uh, forward slash peace, and we've got a whole page there of resources to help you deal with anxiety and shame and depression and burnout that we're going to talk about in these next few weeks. Just encourage you to take advantage of the resources that are there. Get the help you need so that God's truth can become your truth and deal with the shame in your life. I want to end the message with a quote. This is from a, a, a psychiatrist by the name of Carl Menninger. Um, and this is what he said. He said, if I could convince the patients in psychiatric hospitals that their sins were forgiven, 75% of them could walk out the next day. Now, now that quote's stunning for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's stunning because he's a secular counselor. And yet he's still talking about things like sin and forgiveness. But, but here's, the, here's the real amazing thing. This secular counselor understands the, po the powerfulness of shame in our lives or guilt that we hold on to too long in our lives. He recognizes the grip that it can have on us. And literally, he said, if we could just deal with that shame, we would say, if we could just realize that we are forgiven children of God, he said, make just a huge difference in so many people's lives. Folks, that's my prayer for you. My prayer for you is that, first of all, you would see guilt as a, as a healthy thing, a gift from God in the short term to help you repent, to turn away from things in your life uh, that you need to turn away from. But that even more than that, you would let that guilt go and you would never let that guilt become shame. And, and if you are experiencing shame, if you believe that you are a bad person, Know that that's not true. You are a loved, forgiven child of God. Amen. Well, one of the things that Christians have done down through the centuries is we've reminded ourselves of what we believe by confessing our faith. And oftentimes we use things like the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed because these creeds remind us of who our God is and what he's done for us. But this morning, in response to Pastor Mark's message, we actually want to sing what it is we believe. And so I invite you to stand wherever you're gathered and to join us as we sing together, We Praise You and Acknowledge You, O God. This amazing song which tells us who our God is and what he's done for us. Let's sing together. We praise you and acknowledge you.
to take some time to gather our offering. And then the reason why we gather our offering is because we want to respond to what Jesus has told us. He said that where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And we believe that Jesus put those together in that order for that reason. Because you see, I find that when I give to something, it shapes my heart around that thing. And likewise, when we give to the mission of God, it shapes our hearts and our lives around that mission. You'll notice in the chat room that a little a button has popped up inviting you to give. And whether you're giving a one-time gift or setting up recurring giving, know that those gifts and your generosity are going to support the ministry of Trinity as well as that of our missions partners around the world. As together we bring good news to people in need. So we want to say thank you this morning for your generosity. This is also a great time to connect with us. Again, if you are new, we would love to get to know you and to find out how we can pray for you and help you take your next step in your walk with God. You'll notice again in the chat room a little connect button has popped up inviting you to do that. And that will take you to our digital connect card. You can fill that out and let us know how we can be supporting you in this time and season. As we do that, uh, a couple of announcements. First, we want to remind you that this weekend at 11.30 a.m. on Sunday morning, May 17th, is our congregational open forum. And we would love for you to join us for that open forum because it's your chance to hear what God is doing in and through Trinity, to hear a little bit about our upcoming plans, and to ask your questions. So please don't forget to RSVP. RSVPing is what's going to get you the link so that you can join us on the Zoom webinar. And join us at 11.30 a.m. on Sunday, May 17th, for our open forum. We also want to invite you back here to Trinity Kimberly Way on Thursday, May 21st, as we are going to host an Ascension service at 7 o'clock p.m. right here on tlcforyou.online.church. You can tune in and join us as we celebrate the fact that Jesus is not only risen from the dead, but he is also our ascended Lord, that he reigns in glory, and because of that, we have peace and hope. So again, that's going to be happening right here on our streaming service at 7 o'clock p.m. on Thursday, May 21st. Last but not least, we would love to know who is worshiping with you. And so we would ask that uh, while you're worshiping, that you take a selfie of yourself and of your family who's gathered with you. Maybe take a little video of you worshiping together at home and send those to us. We'd like to edit those things together and 
put together a video to show that even though we're separated by distance, we are not separated in spirit as we worship together. So take a little video this, uh, this weekend, take a, a little selfie while you're worshiping and send that in to us. And we would love to edit that together and share that back with the rest of you. Well, having gathered our offerings and taken a moment to connect, we now want to turn our hearts to prayer. See, prayer is this beautiful thing because it reminds us that God is with us, that he hears our prayers and is ready to respond. And so the way we're going to be doing prayer this weekend is we're actually going to be speaking the words of Scripture. And as we speak those words, we are then going to have an opportunity to respond in an attitude of prayer. So what we're going to do is we're going to speak different verses from the Bible, and then I'm going to respond by leading us in a time of prayer. So would you please join me? We want to begin our prayers by speaking together the words of Psalm 29, 11. The Lord gives strength to his people. The Lord blesses his people with peace. We pray. Almighty God, bless and strengthen your church here and throughout the world. Keep us steadfast in faith and courageous in hope. By your spirit, increase in us the hunger for your word, for prayer, for acts of forgiveness and compassion. Use us as we are able to further your purpose and will and to share your unchanging love that the name of Jesus Christ might be glorified around the world and more may know his peace. We speak the words of John fourteen twenty seven: Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. We pray. God of all hope, only you have the power to bring peace to our world, our nation, our communities, and our homes. Grant your peace to those who live in fear, are lonely, depressed, or weary of pandemic measures. We implore you to turn back the pandemic across the globe and to bring healing and relief. Speak tenderly to our hearts so that regardless of our circumstances, we can rest in your deep, abiding peace that passes all understanding. We speak the words of Isaiah 26.3. You will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you, all whose thoughts are fixed on you. Merciful Father, we give you thanks for not dealing with us according to our weakness and guilt, but according to your love and goodness. Through the precious blood of your dear Son, you have forgiven all of our sins. When shame robs us of peace, fix our thoughts on you. Remind us through your word that we are your children and our identity is only in you, our perfect peace. And we speak the words of Psalm 27, 7. Hear my voice when I call, Lord. Be merciful to me and answer me. We praise you, God, for your goodness in hearing the prayers of your people and granting us confidence to approach your throne of mercy. Hear us now in the name of and for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And we draw our prayers to a close by speaking the words that Jesus himself has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, before we sing our final hymn, we want to send you with a word of blessing. Remember that we are Easter people. Shame is swallowed up in victory because Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. So now as you go out in, the, in joy and are led forth in peace, may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. Have a blessed week, everyone. Please join us in our final hymn.